Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and after being a strike breaker for the railroad companies, Hancock would once again be thrust into the political limelight as the presidential election of 1880 approached. Within his new position, Winfield Scott Hancock applied himself to military theory and attempted to revitalize the United States Army. The hulking forces of the Civil War had given way to a poor excuse for an army. Hancock set about doing a few things within his power to improve the armed forces. As one of Hancock's biographers stated, the common soldiers who made up the bulk of the force were volunteers, many foreign-born, many illiterate, who signed up for a hitch of five years. A new recruit received little training before being sent off to a unit. A large proportion of the army's strength was on the frontier. The soldier on the plains spent his day escorting and protecting surveying parties, railroad workers, or traders building structures for his post, occasionally fighting, and more often chasing Indians and combating idleness with cards and alcohol. Poor rations, inadequate housing, and bad treatment by officers compounded the unpleasant conditions, and desertion was common. For one, he supported the regimented practice of rifle instruction. Soldiers were poorly trained to use their weapons, and because there was little opportunity to actually use their rifles, the soldiers exhibited substandard marksmanship. Therefore, Hancock implemented rigorous rifle instruction and training. He even oversaw the instructions at his headquarters in New York. Eventually, he would become president of the National Rifle Association, which was having trouble obtaining members at this time. His prestige helped him keep it afloat. He took that position because he truly believed in the efficiency of knowing how to properly shoot a rifle. Two, he supported the establishment of military schools and training centers. He personally helped establish the Military Service Institution of the United States in September 1878. It was modeled after the British United Service Institution to focus on military science for aspiring officers. Furthermore, his foray into military theory led him to battle it out politically with Emory Upton, another Civil War general. Upton was a West Point graduate of 1861 and had won many accolades during the conflict. He put together the idea of a skeleton army which was not unlike John C. Calhoun's idea for the army in 1820. Although Congress and the American people would not put up with having a large standing army, Upton wanted the army to possess the framework of a large organization. So if a conflict did break out, then the influx of recruits would fill in the gaps and flesh out the skeleton. Hancock had a different plan. He wanted the current army to be staffed at full strength, with each company having 100 men as designated. But to prevent Congress and the people from balking at that thought, only eight companies would be in each regiment. Also, he wanted the army to have less of a presence in the west along the frontier and more of a presence in the east along the coast building fortifications. That way, if war did break out, the country would have a readied force for combat and defenses capable of holding off an invasion. Hancock's plan would not increase the army size that much. It had been reduced to about 25,000 from the 50,000 right after the Civil War ended. The plan would simply fill out the army with able-bodied recruits properly trained and educated. Senator Ambrose Burnside oversaw the committee which heard both Upton and Hancock's arguments, but the bill died in Congress. However, the country did, by default, adopt a similar theory to Upton's skeleton army plan. In 1880, Rutherford B. Hayes' presidency was coming to an end. Hayes admitted that he only wanted to serve one term. So both Republicans and Democrats dove into the political waters to emerge with a candidate. Many Republicans had turned their backs on Hayes, who they saw as not strong enough of a leader. He had pulled troops out of the South, ultimately ending Reconstruction, and he was lackluster when it came to civil service reform. Political arena was ready for Hancock to make his appearance as the presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. He did have some opponents, namely Samuel Tilden, who had lost to Hayes in the controversial election of 1876. However, Hancock got a vital political ally in the two years before the convention. His name was Major Edward A. Burke. Burke was and continues to be an elusive character in history. His military rank was most likely self-bestowed. He claimed to be a Kentuckian, but most people pinned him as being from farther north. He was a master charlatan, and after arriving penniless in New Orleans in 1870, he worked as a day laborer at a stonecutter's yard. But before long, he was a high executive in a small railroad. He used his power to become the political boss of Louisiana. We don't know exactly how Hancock came to know Burke, but it is suspected that he was introduced to the boss 
during his visits to New Orleans to visit the governor, who also used Burke's services. On a side note, Burke would be accused of stealing millions of dollars from the state treasury in 1889, but was never apprehended because he escaped to Honduras and lived a life of luxury the rest of his days. Nevertheless, Burke garnered all the political power he could in Louisiana to send off the delegates from that state to the Democratic Convention with Hancock's name as their primary choice. Burke did the same thing for Texas. One of Hancock's former fellow Corps commanders, Baldy Smith, helped secure the Vermont delegation, and Winfield's other supporters obtained support from other various states. It was looking good for the general. The Democratic Convention met in Cincinnati, Ohio in June 1880 to choose a presidential candidate. Tilden basically sent in a resignation letter informing the delegates that he did not seek nomination. On the first ballot, Hancock was ahead, and by the second ballot, most delegations had given the general their votes. It was an amazing feat by Hancock's advocates. They had secured the votes needed and delivered rousing speeches that instilled a hope and faith that the savior of Gettysburg could win the presidency for the Democratic Party. It would not be easy for Hancock. He would be facing another Civil War general. The Republican convention chose James A. Garfield of Ohio, a dark horse candidate. This was shaping up to be an eventful election. Back at Governor's Island on the military base, Hancock got word of his nomination and the place flooded with well-wishers, including reporters wanting to know Hancock's thoughts. In a very humble way, he thanked everyone, but didn't make any lavish declarations. Reporters also went to William Sherman and asked him what he thought of Hancock's nomination. The leader of the March to the Sea stated that he didn't get involved in politics, but if you will sit down and write the best thing that can be put in language about General Hancock as an officer and a gentleman, I will sign it without hesitation. His nomination sent shockwaves through the Republican Party, who played it off as insignificant in the papers, but behind closed doors realized the gravity of the situation. President Hayes sent word to Garfield that the Democrats had made the best decision they could have made. Another Republican regretted that now the Southern issue and the bloody shirt would have to be put away in lieu of Hancock's nomination. Within his own party, his nomination was celebrated, but some didn't know whether he could pull off a victory. However, one of his former enemies in the Confederacy, but now a Democratic congressman, Joseph E. Johnston, wired Hancock and said, your nomination makes me much gladder than you. Throughout the rest of the year, Hancock welcomed guests in his headquarters, but one of the guests he most enjoyed was his old Mexican war buddy, Harry Heath. They talked of politics, and before leaving, Hancock told Heath, I have made it a rule by which I shall be governed to make no promises. Hancock told of a general in his old corps who wanted to be an ambassador. I will not do it, for I do not think he would fill credibly the position he asks, and I am determined to appoint no man to office that I do not believe qualified to fill it. I have told you that I have intended to look out for you, and I shall do so. Heath relayed to his friend that he sought no appointment, but he did seek another promise. The promise I wish you to make me is something personal to yourself. When you become President of the United States, you will have a great deal of entertaining to do. You will have to entertain crowned heads, possibly, the justices of the Supreme Court, senators, and distinguished people. I want you to promise me at these functions not to mash your potatoes. Hancock roared back, to the devil with you and your potatoes. On July 13, 1880, heads of the Democratic Party went to Governor's Island to perform the notification ceremony for Hancock's nomination. The general was distracted to say the least. His son Russell had been visiting for over a month from Mississippi, but Russell's son, Hancock's grandson, named after the general, after a long bout with an illness, since being in the New York, passed away at 6 o'clock that morning. There was little time for mourning. Hancock was still the commander of the military division of the Atlantic, and now a presidential candidate. There were not enough hours in the day to take care of all matters, and he did not want to ask for leave to run his campaign, so he limited political visits to three hours, three days a week, which irritated many potential visitors. One of his old comrades in blue went to visit him during one of these visitation hours. Finding him surrounded by people, he asked, General, how do you find this thing? Hancock replied, Don't find it at all. There is nothing congenial about this thing. These miserable devils worry me to death. They come here from all parts of the country, even from Arkansas and Texas, to tell me how many votes they can command. Worst of all, they want to expect pledges that I will give them offices for their services. Did you ever see such a hungry crowd? Hungry, hungry, hungry. He sighed and said it was worse than Gettysburg. They take me in front and rear, they outflank me, and worst of all, they cut off my retreat. The locusts of old are as nothing to them. Although Republican newspapers skirted the issue of his military career, 
Some did attack him, but the attacks fell short because most people knew his record and wouldn't believe the false reports. What they did assault him with was his lack of a political career. Inexperience was what newspapers threw at the general as insults, but the only statement that hurt him was one from his former commander, Ulysses S. Grant. In a private discussion, Reverend Fowler recorded what Grant had to say about Hancock. The former president called him ambitious, vain, and weak, and ever since his name had been put up for nomination in the past, that he had been consumed with the thought of being president. Grant even claimed that Hancock had allowed Louisiana politicians to steal $7 million from the state by appointing corrupt officers. When the story was published, Grant regretted the statements because he thought the conversation was private and wouldn't go public. The accusations about Louisiana had been false and retracted by newspapers, but the damage had been done. The subject of Mary Surratt's execution came back to haunt Hancock, but not for long. People were horrified about what happened to her, feeling her punishment unjust. But when her lawyer came out publicly and settled the matter by saying Hancock did all he could to spare the woman's life, the matter was settled. Other statements were run by Democratic newspapers, like the glowing comments by Sherman and even Sheridan were quoted about Hancock. He said, I am not in politics, but General Hancock is a great and good man. Democrats hurled attacks at Garfield for the financial and political scandals he had been involved in as a congressman, but ultimately neither man was completely sunk by these insults or critiques. Hancock was a war hero, and Garfield had been a loyal Union general and a congressman who had made friends in Washington, D.C. It was seemingly evenly matched in many regards. As the election neared, three significant moments hurt Hancock's political aspirations. First, Hancock granted an interview with a reporter who he knew would ask about one of the most contested issues of the election, the tariff. Republicans had supported a protective tariff to protect American businesses and goods from being undercut by foreign products. Democratic candidates were against tariffs in some localities and for it in others. As a party platform, they were for the reduction but not complete abolishment of tariffs. Republicans claimed that the Democrats wanted free trade, which would hurt Americans. So the Democrats needed to defend themselves against this critique. Hancock granted the interview to put that issue to rest. In the discussion, he was vague, but basically said that he would support a tariff to protect the American people. However, he described the tariffs as a local question. To 19th century Americans, this lack of political vocabulary signaled that Hancock was not a politician, and Republicans used this description of tariffs to convince Americans that Hancock was unfit for the job of president. Although not schooled in political rhetoric, Hancock knew what he meant by the term local question. He meant that the tariffs was a geographically dependent question for voters to consider when electing congressmen and senators, but that is not how many took it. Although not Hancock's actions, the mayoral race in New York City became a bone of contention when Democrats put up a Catholic as a mayoral candidate. That very act scared New Yorkers into thinking that the Democratic Party would allow the Pope to run the United States and that state funds would go to support Catholic churches and schools. Thirdly, and possibly one of the most detrimental actions, was the publishing of a letter that was allegedly from the desk of James A. Garfield. Hancock's opponent to a labor union which basically stated that he supported the importation of Chinese laborers to work on farms and in factories in the United States. The letter was a complete hoax and even the labor union which it was addressed to was fictitious. The Democratic Party had supported its publishing, known as the Maury Letter, the portrayal of the party as intentionally deceitful despite Hancock and many of the Democratic politicians having nothing to do with it, hurt the campaign significantly. On November 2, 1880, the election was underway. The South went solidly for Hancock, as expected, but now he needed to secure some Midwestern states and New York. He secured New Jersey, and he still had a lead in New York when at 9.30 p.m., Hancock stood up at his headquarters and said, The results so far are very encouraging, and I hope they will continue to be so, but I am willing to wait till morning, and meantime, get a good night's sleep. I don't care to see any further dispatches or be waked. He then went to bed. During the night, he lost New York, the state he needed to win in order to obtain the presidency. Garfield stayed up late and knew the decision by 3 a.m. Hancock woke up at 5 a.m. and asked Almira what the news was. She said, it has been a complete Waterloo for you. Hancock stated, that is all right, I can stand it, then rolled over and went back to sleep. He had lost his home state of Pennsylvania and his home county of Montgomery by one vote. The electoral vote count stood 214 for Garfield, 
and 155 for Hancock, 185 to win. The 35 electoral votes in New York could have swung the balance the other way for Hancock and the Democrats. There had been some missteps and bad political decisions, but he had lost, albeit with a great showing, only losing the popular vote by 7,018 votes out of more than 9 million votes cast. Although there was talk of fraud specifically in New York, Hancock stated that whether it had been taken from him by other means or if the people had voted against him, he wouldn't change the results. He had been sickened by the political aspirants and charlatans that descended upon him since the nomination, and he left any thought of political office behind him. He even attended Garfield's inauguration, stating, I have no right to any personal feeling in the matter. It is clearly my duty as a soldier to obey. A Democratic Congress has formally announced that the people have duly elected James A. Garfield. It certainly seems that a Democratic candidate should be there to support the assertion. Thomas Nass poetically created a cartoon after the election depicting Hancock sitting next to a fire with his head bowed, while the Spirit of Liberty places her hand on his shoulder, saying, No change is necessary, General Hancock. We are too well satisfied with your brave record as a Union soldier.